Good morning. How are you? Merry Christmas. I always get a little disappointed or a little sad when Christmas is over. You've waited for it so long, you know, and then it just, bam, it's over. But uh, it's such a wonderful time of year and um, just uh, very happy that we can have uh, Pastor Albert and Chris uh, spend it with their family. And um, so Merry Christmas. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm Dave Ziegler. I, I teach up at Rifle High School and um, just, you know, trying to fill in a little bit for Pastor Albert today. Um, when Pastor asked me if I would fill in for him, for him uh, he mentioned that uh, if he would have been here, he would have been finishing up a series uh, on Christmas characters. And uh, he was going to finish up with Simeon and Anna. And he said, you know, if you want to do that, that'd be great. Or if you want to do something else, that's fine, too. And uh, I had to admit that after reading the Christmas story, you know, just dozens of times, I really hadn't paid much attention to these characters. Um, but after rereading their part in the Christmas story, God began showing me all sorts of really good stuff. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's uh, the amazing thing with God's word is you can reread it and new stuff every time you read it. And uh, that's why it's alive and active in our lives. Um, but a theme jumped out to me right from the beginning, and that was about waiting. And, um, you know, so we're going to be talking about uh, Simeon and Anna and trying to apply some of those principles in our lives specifically about waiting. Um, but let's start with the good stuff. And so will you please rise in honor of God's word as we're going to read Luke 2, 21 through 38. Uh, and if you don't have a, a copy of God's word there with you, uh, it's right up here. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll read that. Uh, so here we go. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the, in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was, a righteous, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for rev revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of, his, uh, of Jerusalem. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for this time to look into your word. And we pray that your truth would be revealed this morning. We pray that uh, your uh, thoughts would speak to each of our hearts. I pray that I would just get out of the way and that uh, you would speak clearly through me. God, I just thank you for uh, the opportunity to get into your word and to be together in fellowship. And God, I pray you'd bless this time and I pray that you would be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you may be seated. I'm 
not very good at this. So I'm sitting down. And I'm, I'm not sure if I want to, you know, I don't know. But I'll probably be up and down. and I don't know. It's crazy. Anyway, um, you know, waiting is hard. Have you know, I hate to wait. Do you, is anybody else like that? I mean, I just hate waiting. Waiting is hard. And, you know, it only takes a trip to the grocery store or the gas station to, to illustrate just how terrible I am at waiting. I will have my 17 items, but if that 15 item lane is open, man, I'm in there, you know. I'm going to try and schmooze two items past a little bit. Or if, if I go into the gas station, you know, we, we were on our way to, uh, to Las Vegas for Christmas. Uh, Kathy's family lives in Henderson. And so we were on our way there for Christmas, and we stopped to get gas in Grand Junction at the Bradley because it's like, I don't know, $3 cheaper than here or something. <laughs> anyway, so there's like, a, you know, cars everywhere, and I'm trying to maneuver into the shortest line, and, you know, I forget which car I'm on, you know, and, and the gas tank's on one side in our van, and it's on the other side. And so you go there, and you get that, oh, no. And then somebody moves out, so you work around, but in between somebody gets there, and you're just like, oh, i got to get in the shortest line. And you're going everywhere to save, like, 32 seconds because you can't, I mean, what? we got to get there. You know, it's a seven-hour trip, but if I save these 32 seconds, then it's going to be fine. And I, we, we, we are terrible. I am terrible at waiting. I think we as a society are terrible at waiting. And, and when we think about waiting, it really, I mean, waiting to us is a, a completely different thing than I think that, like, Simeon and Anna were, were talking about. But what waiting means to us, it, you know, we're, uh, we wait uh, for seconds or maybe minutes. We measure our wait time maybe in hours and and. Heaven forbid if we have to wait a day or two. You know, we're a fast food, fast fix, fast information society, and I, I think it's just going to get worse. We have information that when I was in college, you had to research stuff, and you had to go to the library, and if they didn't happen to have that periodical or that journal in the library, you would sign a little card, and they would say, well, we've got this lender's agreement with an another library, and it may get in in a couple, three days, or maybe a week. You go, oh, that's all? Okay. You know, now it's like we can cha-cha or Google anything, and, and it's like in a second. Um, we were on our way to Las Vegas, and um, we're in the midst of a very important event in the Ziegler family, and it's the fantasy football uh, finals that started last week and will end this week. Uh, it's the Zigtastic Football League. And this is one of the first years that I've actually done well. And so it's my wife and I are in the championship. And we have to wait for updates. We're driving on a Sunday. We don't know who's scoring for us. And, and she said, man, if we only had a smartphone, you know, because we can't now wait till we get to the end of our trip to find out the scores. We have to get it right then. And in fact, the Bronco game was going on. And we were missing all the highlights of the Bronco game. Um, now, Kathy and Caleb and Micah, they all speak pretty good Spanish, and I don't at all. Um, but we happened to find the radio station of the Bronco game in Spanish. <laughs> and uh, so they were, they were excited. They are just getting updates, and I'm just going, what's happening? What's happening? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I'm not even going to pretend to speak Spanish here, for, but it, it was something like this. It would be, blah, 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 I formation, blah, 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 you know, and are they in the I formation? Yes, they are. And then blah, 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 Peyton Manning, blah, 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 you know, and so <laughs> I'd have to wait for translation in between and stuff, but it was like I was on pins and needles. I couldn't, I couldn't process it fast enough. Um, our wait time is not very long. But I want to talk a little bit about what waiting was like for Simeon and Anna. And uh, just to give a, a little kind of perspective, uh, Simeon and Anna, uh, we uh, see them in Luke at the beginning of the New Testament. And now it's been 400 years since the end of the New Testament, since the prophet spoke uh, in the book of Malachi. 
It's been 400 years, and the nation of Israel has been in turmoil for 400 years. There's been prophecy out there about Messiah, but no one knows when that's going to happen. And um, so I just want to do, uh, in, in researching for this, and, and I, as I got to looking at Simeon and Anna, both of them were, were very old, and both of them were looking forward to uh, God's redemption of Israel and the Messiah to come. But they didn't just have to wait for their life. They had to wait as a nation for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and I, I just want to do a quick little background of how we got to the, the place that they were at. In about 435 B.C., when the prophet Malachi was done writing, the center of the world power uh, was shifting from the east to the west. Um, up to this time, Babylon had been in control of the nation of Israel, and um, then um, this was soon succeeded by the uh, Medes and the Persians, uh, and they were in control when uh, Malachi was writing his prophecy. Uh, that shift was predicted uh, in the book of Daniel, uh, who said that there would rise up a bear who was higher on one side than on the other, and that signified the division between Media and Persia, and the Persians were the dominant uh, culture in that time, but that was the two cultures that were in control at the time. Now, at the height of the Persian power, there uh, arose in the country of Macedonia, which we know now to be Greece, uh, a man by the name of Philip of Macedon, hence Macedonia. Uh, and he became the leader of his country, and he united the islands of Greece together, and he became their, their ruler, and his son was destined to become one of the great world leaders of all time. His son was Alexander the Great. So in 330 B.C., there was this huge battle between the Persians and the Greeks, and, and it just entirely altered the world's history. In that battle, Alexander, as a young man who was only 20 years old, led the armies of Greece in victory over the Persians and completely demolished uh, the power of Persia. And so now we're in the, in the 300s B.C., and uh, the Greeks are starting to influence the world at that time. Now, just a few short years later, Alexander died. He, he kind of drank himself to death. He was only 30 years old. He uh, had no sons. His son had been murdered. And so he gave over uh, the, the power of his, his empire to four generals, and two of them are particularly important. One general was named Ptolemy, and he gained Egypt. So Egypt's to the south, and then there's Palestine, and then the other general, his name was Seleucus, he got control of Syria. So we got Syria to the north, we got the land of Palestine where the uh, Israelites were, and then we have uh, Egypt to the south. Now during the time of Grecian influence, it was, uh, it was coming into the land of Palestine, even into the Israelite people. And they were eager to bring in that culture. And there were some who thought that they ought to fully embrace that culture. And uh, so that, that group of Jews was called the Hellenists, or Greek lovers. And, and so they wanted to liberal, liberalize the Jewish laws. They, they kind of felt like they were a little bit too oppressive. And so there's this group that said, we need a more liberal Israel, and then there was another group that was really strongly holding on to the, the traditions and the law, and they wanted to preserve everything according to the Mosaic order. They resisted all the foreign influences that, uh, that were coming in, and that group of people became known as the Pharisees, which means to separate out from this other influence coming in. On the other hand, the Hellenists, the Greek lovers, became more and more influential in the politics of the land. So you had the Pharisees being the religious leaders of the land, and this other group, the Hellenists, became kind of political leaders of the land, and they formed the party that was known in the New Testament as the Sadducees. The liberals is what it means. And they turned away from the strict interpretation of the law, and they became very much rationalists and uh, uh, logical thinkers, uh, and they decided to go away from anything uh, in the supernatural. And we see Jesus interacting with them in his life. The Sadducees would come to him, and they would try and trap him about 
the, uh, the afterlife because they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the supernatural. And there's one particular instance where they talk about a woman who has several husbands and they all die. And they say when she dies, who will be her husband when she goes? Because they're trying to trap them. They, they think there's no answer uh, because they really didn't believe in, uh, in uh, resurrection. And so these people, the Sadducees, came from that influence from the Greek culture where they felt like we need more logic, we need more uh, liberality from the, uh, the laws of Moses and things like that. So we have these two factions that become increasingly more important in that time between when Malachi uh, prophesied and when we come to see Jesus being born. Also during this time in Egypt, under the reign of one of the Ptolemies, the Hebrew scriptures were translated for the first time into another language. In about 284 B.C., a group of 70 scholars 